Amen. Welcome again to Discovery Church. I'm so excited that you guys are here. Everywhere you're joining us, online, outside, at Cal State, Northwest. Come on, Southwest Campus. Let everybody know. Are you excited to be in God's house? I love digging into the Word of God with you over these last. Now this is the eighth installment of this series, The Names of God. And I just hope that you're grabbing hold of more of God, like, like how your relationship with God can be so much more rich. God has revealed himself through his word in so many ways, intentionally, so that we can relate to him very personally and practically. So we've been studying how maybe God wants to operate and be active in our life. And you can watch all of these online. Last week was one of the core messages in this season of my life about God as Father and approaching God and knowing God as Abba Father. And if you missed that, you got to go check that out. I think it's so foundational to our faith as disciples of Jesus and your identity as a man or a woman of God to understand you are a son and you are a daughter. If you miss it, go check that out. But I'm excited to jump into another name that I hope today is going to stretch your faith. Here's what I want to increase your faith today to believe in this name specifically. And let me set it up for you because we're going to go to the book of Exodus to learn about this name, where God reveals his name to his people. This is coming right after God delivers the Hebrews from Egyptian slavery. So he shows that he is the most powerful, awesome, miracle-working God, stronger than the false gods of uh, Egyptians. And God leads them, delivers them out, but he leads them to a dead end. And that was even intentional. Remember, God takes you to places of crisis so he can reveal who he is to us. So he leads him intentionally to a dead end. And Moses grabs his staff, the stick in his hand, and lifts it up above that water. And you know the story. You watch the movie, right? Okay, the, the, sea, the Red Sea splits. They walk through the sea. The Egyptians try to follow, and the sea swallows them up and destroys the Egyptian army. And so this is an amazing miracle. They see the deliverance of God, not just in Egypt, but at the Red Sea. Three days later, they come to another point of crisis. They're without water. And obviously, to be in the wilderness and in the desert without water, this is life-threatening, not just to them, but their children. This is to their family. This is to their livestock and livelihood. No water. Okay, so the, another crisis moment, which, which I think it, you need to understand that on the heels of your greatest victories will often come your greatest tests. And here they are, they're going in the right direction, right? They're on the right path, but they run into difficult circumstances. How many of you know you can be on the right path and still face difficulty, amen? You can still face sickness and disease and pain and difficulty, even though you're going in the right direction. Where here they are, going in the right direction, being delivered, but they come to the place of the end of themselves again, and they start to wonder, is God really with us? And start to question that. They, they get to this pool of water, finally, after three days of, of drought, no water, and they try to drink it, and the water is bitter. It's not drinkable. And so God, and I'll study this with you. We'll, we'll, we'll study more of the scriptures later, but I'm just giving you the overview of it. God tells Moses to grab a branch, a stick from a tree, and throw it into the water, and the water turns from bitter to sweet, and they're able to drink it. And it's in when the context of this story, Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, that after this miracle, here's what happens. God tells them, he gives them a covenant, reestablishes a covenant, and reveals his name that he wants to be known by his people. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord, your God, and do what is right, very key, what is right in his eyes, not what's right in your eyes, not what's right in their eyes, not what's right in your parents' eyes or Egypt where you were coming from. Do what's right in his eyes. If you pay attention to his commands and keep all of his decrees, then I will not bring any, on you any of the diseases I brought onto Egypt. For I am, here's the word, Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord who heals you. Somebody say Rapha. Okay, here's what Rapha means. The, word, the Hebrew word means to heal, restore, cure, mend, or repair. This is how God wants to be known. This is who he is. This is his nature and how he wants to be known and relate to you. He is a God that heals you, that restores you, that cures you, that will mend you, that will repair you. Very key, though, in this is God says, here's the covenant if you do what's right in my eyes. Because you can try to do what's right in your eyes, and you can follow the customs and traditions and decrees of the Egyptians where you're coming out from. But if you follow my word, then what they are suffering with, you won't suffer with. 
Some of you are complaining about suffering, but you're not following the ways of God. You're following the ways of Egypt, and you're wondering why you're suffering, okay? He says, no, no, here's, here's the covenant. If you follow my word and my decrees, then what's on them won't be on you. You don't have to. Look, you, child of God, you should not be living and suffering like the world suffers. You should not be. You got a promise and a covenant that's greater than this world. You serve Jehovah Rapha, the healer, restorer, cure of men, and repairer. We're going to talk about a God who heals today. And in the church, there's a lot of people who think differently than, you know, think differently on the subject. You probably think differently on this subject. You might. Today, we're going to look at a biblical approach to this. What does God's word say about Jehovah Rapha and about healing? Let me first give you two theological errors where I believe the pendulum has swung too far to one side, where there's partial truth, but ultimately it fails to be truth in these theological viewpoints about healing. Write these down, okay? Because the first one is a word I made up called confessionist. That's a word I made up, confessionist. It basically is this. It's your name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. You know what I mean? And this pendulum swings to the point where these people say, well, you can just say, speak whatever you want, and your words have the power. Well, that's not completely true because, well, it's partially true. Your words have power, but your words don't have the power, okay? You can't just say something and have it, okay? So, so a lot of people who believe this say, they'll say, if you're sick then, then there's got to be something, some sin in your life or something wrong or distance between you and God. And it's really never God's will for you to have infirmity or illness or poverty of any kind. Well, that just contradicts the word of God because God's word says he'll use all of that stuff to teach you to build your character and to save your soul. So that's, the pendulum is swung way too far. This confession is name and claim it kind of, but then the pendulum swings way far to the other approach, which is, write it down, the cessationist approach, with, which this theological belief, cessationism, it just means that God does not heal today. That's the, it actually, the belief, even though there's no biblical support, there's no scripture about it, they say, yes, there's miracles in the Bible, but they just don't happen today. And here's how they teach it. They say, when the final apostle died, God just closed down the shop and there ain't no more miracles he's doing today. Well, that's just not true. That's not true. God's still doing miracles today. We see it. I I don't think I've met a Christian that actually believes that God does not heal or does do miracles. I think it's just maybe some academic elites or something like that who don't practice the word. But anyway, there's there's where the challenge comes from. Because we think like, well, I've, I've heard God do some things and seen God do some great things, but we've also buried people we've prayed for. And I've experienced that personally. I know what it feels like to be in the middle of that tension. But what does God's word say about healing in Jehovah Rapha? The clearest scripture in the New Testament on this is in James chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. It says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. We're going to come back to that. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Here's what you do. If anyone among you is sick, let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord, which is what we're going to offer today. At the end of the service, we're going to pray for healing, Jehovah Rapha, over you, okay, and anoint you with oil. Now, you got to ask for the oil. We're not going to slab it on you, you know, just be all dunking you with oil. you got to ask for it. got to be permission for it. But here's what you need to know about this oil. The oil does not save you, right? The oil is a symbol. Just like baptism doesn't save you, right? It's, it's a sim- Jesus saves you. Baptism doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. So, so what are these things the, in, the, in, in the Bible and in our faith? They are symbols to get our faith activated and involved because he says the prayer offered in what? Faith will make the sick person well. Now, every time there was healing in the Bible recorded, there's this word also in operation and activated. Faith is working. Faith is being activated. The Lord will raise them up. And then he says, if they've sinned, even they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So here's what I want you to know about Jehovah Rapha today. And again, my whole hope, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, my hope today is to stir your faith, to get you to believe God's word is true, and then I'm gonna show you how to access it yourself. But here's what I, I need you to believe. Too. I need you to believe God still heals people. Can I get an amen, somebody? God still heals people today. Some of you ought to write something else in there, though, because maybe you believe God heals people. You just don't know if it's for you. So write down this, God still heals me. 
God still heals me. Can I get a better amen, somebody? He still heals. Do you believe that? Psalm 103, verse 2 and 3 says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not. Hey, don't forget this, what God has done. Don't forget all of his benefits, who forgives all your sins. But it doesn't stop there at the forgiveness. He also heals all your diseases. He does both. He forgives your sins and he heals your diseases. Well, it's not part of that verse is true now and the other part isn't true. That, that's silly. No, all of it is true. So here's three declarations that I want you to make today as we encounter and experience Jehovah Rapha in our life. Three declarations. The first is this. I can be healed physically. Oh, I want to stir your faith to believe this for yourself. You actually can be, you are a perfect candidate to be healed physically. Matthew chapter four, Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria. The people brought to him, look, all who were ill with various diseases. Those suffering severe pain, it doesn't list the pain, but all, all kinds of pain, neck pain, head pain, back pain, knee pain, fasciitis pain, plantar fasciitis was up in there too, man. Someone's like, I got flat feet, Jesus, can you, I need help me out. <laughs> the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Amen. That's, we see it in the gospels, we see his healing. But, but wait, but is he healing now? Hebrews 13, eight, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's, meaning if he healed then, he can do it again. If he saved then, he can save now. Okay, he is the same God. So answer this for me out loud, wherever you're at. Did Jesus forgive all your sins on the cross? Yes, he forgave all your sins, but you still sin. Well, you do, I don't. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. That was a joke. That was a lie, by the way. That was a lie. That was a sin. Y'all saw a sin in person right there. I sinned. That was just an example. Lighten up. Lighten up. Some of you are like. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. If he bore my sin, why do we still sin? Check this out. You need, you need to grab this, you guys. He bore your sin, yet we still sin. He bore your sickness, yet we still get sick. Sometimes. I, wh why is that? I remember one of the greatest miracles I saw, and I've seen, I could tell you so many stories, but when we first launched Discovery Church, there was this, this married couple that, it was in 2013, the husband had lung collapse and failure. I forgot exactly what was happening, but he was in the hospital for almost a month, and they were telling her, it's, this is it. He can't be on this ventilator any, anymore. And we're going to have to take him off. They tried to take him off and he couldn't breathe. He was just, he, he was dying. So they had to keep putting him, they tried and they, they couldn't, they couldn't take him off. But it came to the end where insurance ain't going to cover anymore. There's nothing we can do. We can't keep him on this anymore. We're going to have to take him off and just give him some sedation and let him pass. She calls us and says, well, I need a miracle. And I hear the tremor in her voice like he can't leave. This can't be it. We need a miracle. I grab some anointing oil. I go to the hospital. And as you know, Sometimes the hospital, the smell of death is in the room, right? And this is, it's just the, the stench of it. But I get in the room and there's a different smell. There's an anointing in that place. And I knew God had wanted to do something different in there. And I started ministering to her and ministering to him. And I get that oil and we prayed a prayer of faith and declared the blood of Jesus and by his wounds that we are healed. And that night, he started breathing by himself and went home that next morning. And they don't know what the world happened, how his lungs restored and were healed. It was a miracle. And there's so, you probably have a lot of stories yourself that you've either seen or healed. But the question goes, well, then why doesn't it happen all the time? If it happened then, then why doesn't it happen? The reality is this. Here's the simple answer. You guys, we live in a broken, fallen world and we live in broken, fallen bodies. And the truth is neither swing of the pendulum. The confessionists who just want to name it and claim it and the cessationists that say it doesn't happen, they're not right. It's not always God's will to heal a person physically. You can pray sincerely and have faith that God can heal, but if it's not God's will to provide healing at that time, it's not going to happen. It's not. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that just because he didn't, it affects my belief? No. No, it does not. He is God, and I am not. 
Sometimes God's blessings come in other ways besides physical healing. Now, if, if it were God's will for people to be healed all the time, then everyone would be healed every time they were getting sick. And good health were always, if it was always God's will, then, then Christians would never die. Well, that's not the reality. This place is not heaven. Earth is not heaven. And as much as we want it to be, and as much as we are called to bring heaven on earth as it is in heaven, let it be on earth. There is a part of the kingdom dynamic that we must understand theologians call already, but not yet. There is already a kingdom at hand that was proclaimed that we are advancing, that we are administering, that we are bringing and declaring, but it is not yet fully. We will one day put on perfection glorified bodies where there will be no tears or sorrow or pain or death. But the question becomes, how then am I healed? Now, I want to help you out with this today, but here's the short answer. You are healed the same way you're forgiven, by faith through grace. That's the same. He forgives all our sins and he heals all of our diseases the same way. It's not up to you. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to. No, no, no. It is by faith. He already has it for you. It is by faith through grace. Grace, I just need you to, I'm going to stir you up today to believe God's word. I can be healed physically. Here's the second thing you need to know about Jehovah Rapha. I can be healed mentally and emotionally. That's available to you. Rapha, Jehovah Rapha can heal you mentally and emotionally. Some people think that God might be punishing them with their physical illness or even their mental or emotional issues and illnesses Please listen to me. You got to get this inside of your spirit as truth today because it's the truth that's going to set you free. And, and the lie that God is punishing you is keeping some of you bound to cycles that are repeating in your life that God actually wants you to be set free from. Please listen. God cannot punish you for your sin. Please hear that. You need to hear me. God cannot punish you for your sin because he already punished Jesus for it. You, you got to receive this truth or else the enemy will keep lying to you and keep you bound under what was already provided in Jesus Christ. You, the punishment is not upon you. It's upon him. Oh, he, oh, this is, I'm suffering. This is the reason why I'm, I'm suffering. This is the reason that this tragedy is happening. No, 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 that's not God. God does not punish his children for sin. No, that punishment is taken care of on Jesus. Some of you may need some, some mental and emotional healing though. Maybe you're experiencing some things like sleeplessness and detachment and despair or depression or anger, isolation, bitterness and frustration and fear. A lot of these mental and emotional challenge, illnesses and, and issues that we have come from a lot of different things like, like maybe abandonment or broken trust or even chronic pain and illness or rejection. Even the lack of community or a sense of meaninglessness can cause mental and emotional pain. We live in a society with psychotherapy, counseling, pro, counseling programs, treatment centers, antidepressant drugs, recovery groups, and, and self-help books and videos and podcasts. Many of them, listen to me, they're wonderful and life-saving, but we also live in a country that's among the world's worst when it comes to a lack of emotional health. There's a huge gap there, isn't there? Maybe you're in that gap, tired of emotional pain and wondering how to get healed. Let me be clear. I absolutely believe some people suffering from damaged emotion need to get professional help. It's the reason why we started the Discovery Counseling Center, that there are some things that you need to navigate through with a, with a counselor, not just, because here's the deal. Sometimes though, we try to cope with the symptoms and stop short of the source of the pain. And we treat the symptoms and we never get the rafa, the cure, the repair and the healing. And God wants to go to the source and give you rafa. I'm going to show you how to get your healing today in just a moment. But I just need to work on your faith verse. I need you to believe Psalm 147 verse 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That word binds, it means to bandage, to restore. God, did, you, did you know God wants to heal? He can heal your heart issues. I'm not talking about maybe you have a, a murmur up in here. He can do that too, okay? Some of you have an arrhythmia, which by the way, I have a miracle story of my daughter being healed of a murmur and a mur arrhythmia miraculously. God can do that, okay? But I'm talking about your heart pain, like your broken trust and your betrayal. God wants to heal that. God wants to heal your memories that you visit in your past. The, the memories that haunt you and torment you and cause you stress and triggers. 
cause you not to trust people, will cause you not to step into things that you know God wants you to step into. God wants to heal the brokenness inside of you. That's what Rafa means. He doesn't want to just heal you physically. He wants to heal you mentally and emotionally. Isaiah 61 verse 1 is this prophecy that Jesus actually spoke of himself in the book of Luke. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up, again, to bandage your broken heart, to proclaim freedom for the captives. Really important that you understand here that Jesus isn't talking about real prisoners in Roman jail cells here. That's not the prophecy. It's actually talking about those who are in prisons of their past prisons of their pain, prisons of their broken hearts. The darkness, it says, release the, from darkness for the prisoners. Jesus, God, Jehovah Rapha wants to heal your mental and emotional wounds. God has a good plan for your life, and he wants to heal you wherever you hurt. Jesus said in John 10, 10, that he has come to give you abundant life. And that abundant life has to do with making you whole, restored, cured, mended, and healed mentally, physically, emotionally. And write this down. I need you to know, I can be healed spiritually. That, that, that whatever spiritual condition, whatever strongholds and spiritual attacks, God wants to heal, deliver, and set free spiritually. This is is what actually is most important. Oftentimes in Jesus' ministry, he would heal all diseases and, and cast out demons and, and all kinds of ailments. He was, as we just read, but very often he had to redirect people's focus to the things not on this earth, not, not to our circumstances and our bodies, but on the eternal things of heaven. Very often he had to fix people's focus the right way. Yeah, 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 I am and I can and I will heal you, but I need you to know that there is something greater that you need. Jesus was, remember in John chapter four, he was at this well and there was this beautiful story of the woman at the well and he asked her for a drink of water and, 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 and they get into this conversation. He gives her some, some, some prophecy and, and, and he tells her something because here she is, she's in need of a lot. She's in need of a whole lot. She's got um, divorces and relationship issues and heartbreak and and Jesus gives her a revelation. He says, whoever drinks of the water I give him will never be thirsty again. What you think you need, you think you need water to quench your thirst, like physical water. What you need is living water. What you think you need is physical healing, but what you really need is spiritual healing. You think you need to just work on your emotional health. True, yeah, I, I, but God says, I wanna go even deeper than that. I wanna, I wanna do something inside of your spirit. The water that I give, him will become in him a spring of water satisfying the thirst of God, welling up, continually flowing and bubbling, thing, bubbling within him to eternal life. God wants to heal you, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. First Peter chapter two, verse 24 says, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Look what he says. By his wounds, look at the tense of the language. You have been healed. I love the language in the Bible. I'm, I love studying the language of the word of God. This is in the present indicative tense that you have been healed. This is accessible, available to you now because of the wounds of Jesus Christ. You can be, not only can be, but you have it already. You have been healed. You have it. It's yours. It's, it's available to you. The kingdom of heaven is now, and it is available to you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So how then can we experience this God? How can we experience Jehovah Rapha? And I hope today you believe the word of God, that your faith is stirred, that your expectancy is lifted. How can we experience Jehovah Rapha? Okay, let me give you a few ways, and then I'm gonna actually open up these altars at the end of the service, and we're gonna believe for Jehovah Rapha to show up in your life today. Amen? Okay, here's, here's number one, though. You got to stop complaining to people and start crying out to God. Okay, so some of you are canceling out your own blessing and your miracle for the things that are coming out of your mouth. God goes straight to the heart of the problem with the prescription I'd like to offer you. You might be surprised by its simplicity. We said it in James chapter 5. He said, is anyone among you in trouble? Let him pray. Okay, that word trouble... In that verse, it means afflicted, 
suffering, enduring hardship, or distress. You know, anxious, d- distress, stress, discouraged. Have you ever felt that way? Of course you have. We all have. Stop complaining to people about it and start crying out to God. Here's why. Complaining is a sign of rebellion. Here's what complain. Complaining is a signal Anytime you complain, here's the signal. It's a signal of your heart turning away from God, listen to me, and returning back to the old life that you're coming from. That's what the signal is. I'm telling you, if you continue in your complaining, your heart will shift from God and you will start doing the things you used to do, the habits you used to do, the words you used to say, the people you used to be around. You will go back to Egypt if you keep complaining. God, com- complaining is a sign of rebellion. Look at the, uh, let's look at it in the story here back in, in Exodus chapter 15. It says, Then Moses led the people of Israel away from the Red Sea, and they moved out into the desert of Shur. They traveled in the desert for three days without finding any water. When they came to the oasis of Mara, the water was too bitter to drink. Think about that. They're three days, and then finally they got some water. Someone drinks it, and they're like, oh my, I can't. This, it's too bitter. It's too poisonous. So they called the place Mara, which means bitter. That's what it actually means. Then the people looked. The people complained and turned against Moses. What are we going to drink? They demanded. So Moses cried out to the Lord for help. They complained, but he cried out. Here's what you need to know about complaining. God hates complaining. Whenever you complain, I just need to know that God, now God doesn't hate a complainer, but he hates complaining. You go read Exodus. He was about to do away with these people. If Moses would have interceded for them and stood in the gap because of their complaining, he was about to wipe them out. God hates complaining. You know why? Because it implies you don't trust God. You know, so when we are complaining, it's not really about others and it's not really about that situation that we're facing it's about God. What we're really complaining about is his provision for our life. If you go and continue to read Exodus, Moses actually told the people just that. He said, your complaints, you think they're to us, but you're actually complaining to God. See, you need to write down something extra here because maybe some of you need to stop complaining to people, but, but some of you need to write down, stop complaining about people. Okay? Because you're compla- you think it's that you think you're just projecting onto a person or maybe a situation the problem. But what God is saying, that's not really the problem. What your real problem is, you don't trust me in it. And you're blaming them for it. And you're robbing yourself of the miracle. You're robbing yourself of healing. It implies you don't trust God. You know, God, God, God hates it. He hates the complaining. Complaining is the exact opposite of thanksgiving. That's another reason why God hates complaining. He says, do all things, and all things give thanks. I'm telling you, there is not one situation when you're complaining that you could not instead find a reason to give thanks in the middle of it. There is not one situation that you are facing in your life that you cannot choose thanksgiving instead of complaining. Here's why this is so important, you guys. Complaining poisons your attitude. And not only is it poison like the waters of Mara, but it poisons other people around you as well. How many of you have ever like felt perfectly fine, perfectly content about a situation or another person? And then one person comes to you and starts complaining about a person, poisons you, gives you Mara, bitter water. Now you can't even look at them the same and you're bitter against them too. Okay, you know why? Because I'm telling you, complaining is poisonous. Some of you, the reason why you're not healed yet, please hear me, is because some of the people that you're hanging around with and listening to is poisoning the water. Some of you, the reason why you're not healed yet is because your own voice that's poisoning your water. Stop complaining and cry out to God. Here's number two. You want to experience Jehovah Rapha? Do what God says to do, even when it doesn't make sense. Okay, so here's what God says. Here's my covenant. If you do what's right, in my eyes. Look, do do what I said. My word, God's word is truth. It is the guiding principle of our life, not what's cool or popular or right in culture. It is the word of God. It is the standard. Do what it says. It's important to remember that the Lord is our healer, but the word of God is the medicine. You got to speak the scriptures over. I'm telling you, when you declare the word of God over your own life, it, it works wonders for us. 
Here's what happened to the Hebrews in Exodus chapter 15. As we continue, verse 25. The Lord showed him a piece of wood, a branch on a tree. Moses threw it in the water, and it made the water good to drink. What in the world is this? This is not a purification principle that we understand today. Okay? There was no, like, chemical or periphery. This is, makes no sense. Following, faith is following God's instructions, even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it's not logical, even when it's not rational, faith means being obedient. You do what Jesus tells you to do. I love this story of, of Jesus turning water into wine in the New Testament. Uh, there's an amazing piece of advice that Mary, the mother of Jesus, gives us in that story that's one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. Here's, here's the, the, let me paint the picture, remember, because she's the one who came to Jesus and said, hey, we got a problem here. She's kind of taking over the situation, but all of a sudden, here's how I think it played out. I think she's getting ready to just bark out around and tell everybody what to do, and then all of a sudden she remembers, oh yeah, he's God. So she doesn't talk to him about the problem anymore. She just goes to everybody else and goes, hey, he's getting ready to say something and it's probably gonna be strange because look, I, I raised him. He's just different, okay? He's a different kind of kid. And he said, what, whatever he says, it's probably not gonna make sense. John chapter two, verse five. She said to the servants, even in a, look, just do whatever he tells you. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Do whatever he tells you. And by the way, what he told them to do didn't make sense. It didn't. Like, it, like take these waters of these jugs and fill it with, with water and serve it. She says, look, he just, just do it. Don't think about it too long. Because if you think about it too long, it'll mess you up. Don't analyze it. Come on, everybody like Nike, just do it. Y'all think that they made that up. It was in the Bible. Just do it. Now, why did she say that? Why did she have to say, hey, guys, hey, just, just, just do whatever? You know why? Because God is famous for doing things that you don't understand, that you don't agree with, that you don't even get or can't comprehend. You know why? Isaiah 55 tells us that this plan that God has, his plan, is not what you would work out. If I had it my way, man, if I could heal, I'd go down to the hospital right now. If I was, the one, if I was God, if you were God, we'd all be in trouble. Shut your mouth. <laughs> Neither are my thoughts the same as yours. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than yours. In other words, God is famous for doing things different from us. And that makes sense because he knows more than us. He sees more than us. He is smarter and infinitely more wise than us. The problem is too many people say, no, I don't want to do it that way. I need to understand it first. I got to let it pass through here before it gets to here. And, and too many of us serve God in that kind of direction. We got to go from here to here when God wants you to live from here to here. He wants you to get into your spirit. We analyze everything. We theolo theologize everything. Well, that doesn't make sense to me. Well, I just don't understand that. Why would God, why does this, uh, this just make, I, I, I can't go there until it makes sense to me. Well, then God can never do anything that's greater than your brain then. Bigger than your understanding. We have to come to the place where every one of us turn loose and just trust God and, and I'll tell you guys, God is notorious for doing that. Do what God says to do, even when it doesn't make sense. Number three, focus on what God wants to do in you, not just for you. Because God is actually doing something, producing something inside of you. Now, we always want to focus on the problem. And God has this other trait that we might not, not like that much. And that is he'll, he'll take that problem. He didn't cause the illness. He didn't cause the sickness. He didn't cause the, the disease, but he'll take that problem. And if he sees an opportunity to teach you something in the middle of it, he will. And by the way, he can do it on any problem, in every problem, every situation, he can teach you something. So here's what happens. He delays the healing while he's working on your character because he's actually more concerned about what's going on inside of you than all the external stuff that we get all mixed up about because he knows that the stuff out here is going to fade away, but the stuff in here is eternal. So here we are going through whatever, sickness, pain, loss, trouble. God wants to do a deeper work. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Listen to me. God says, if you're not holy, if you don't let me purify inside of you, there's nothing, you're not going to be able to see me. And then he says this, look after each other, 
so that no one fails to receive the grace of God. Now, wait a second. He's talking about holiness, and then he's talking about your relationships. I'm telling you, they're connected. These two are very connected. You don't think they are. You wish that your relationship with God and your holiness determined with your relationship with him. It has more to do, a lot more to do with your relationship with other people than you realize. So he goes, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you. And actually, it's corrupting a lot of people right now, that poisonous root of bitterness, that mara, that, that, that bitter water that a lot of people are drinking. Listen to me. Here's, here's what he's saying. If you don't have peace with someone and there's bitterness, you got Mara in your heart, you're not going to see God. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. See, so what really matters is, is not this external stuff. What really matters is what's going on on the inside of you. Okay, because yeah, I know he, did, he can and he will and he does. He does do it. But what's most important, you, just need, you can't get focused on what God wants, is doing for you and not, and not realize what he's actually wanting to do inside of you. Luke chapter 10, verse 20, uh, Jesus said, don't rejoice because evil spirits obey, but rejoice because your names are actually registered in heaven. That's the greatest miracle. Not that evil spirits obey and you got your miracle here. Your, your greatest miracle is that your name is written in the book in heaven. So, so if we want to experience Jehovah Rapha, you, you got to get your focus right. Don't focus on what God just wants to do for you. Focus on what he's trying to do inside of you. And then number four, here's what I want you to do today. I want you to believe God for the unbelievable. Because it's the prayer offered in faith that'll make the sick person well. In other words, I want to encourage you to be people who just trust God for big things things. I mean, really trust God for some things that are flat out unbelievable in every other area of your life. For your family to trust God, for your family, for your marriage, or for your children, or for your body, or your mind, or your past, or your calling, or your, your finances. Jesus said in Mark 10, 27, he looked at them and he said, with man, it might be impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Some of you know my name is Veronica's assistant, Faith Ernest. Some of you have the pleasure of knowing Faith. Some of you don't. Some of you have seen her around, but you may not know her personally. You may not know her story. Faith is 23 years old, but she was born with half a heart. And her heart is on the opposite side of her body. Along with many of her major organs are on the wrong side of her body, and she was born without a spleen. So all of this caused a lot of disaster and trials as she was born. She wasn't supposed to survive. She went through so many surgeries by the, by the age of four years old. She had gone through countless surgeries and she was going through this you know, surgery in LA and the doctor said, this, if this is gonna work, it's, the surgery's probably not gonna work, she's probably gonna die from the surgery, but even if it does work, which most likely it isn't, she's not gonna live very long after this. What's, mo what's important for you guys to do right now is just to go say your final goodbyes. And her mom, Marisol, had been praying and fasting and speaking in the spirit for so long. She'd been in the hospital for a while, been under anesthesia, and she said, no, nope, that's not going to happen. I'm not receiving that. That's not what my God, my God will do. And she burst through the, the, the doctors and the social workers that are there trying to console them. She's like, I'm not hearing it. She jumped on that bed, and her daughter is in anesthesia at four years old, grabs her cheek, and her daughter wakes up, and she says, Faith, you listen to me. You will live and not surely die. Do you hear me? And she just, so she got up from that bed and continued to pray and fast. No, that's not going to happen. And I mean, she's 23 years old. She's, she wasn't supposed to, in fact, she would go to, she, had, she has to and has had to her whole life go to LA routinely to go see the doctors to get what's called longevity tests. Longevity, meaning they were telling her how long she had to live. All her life, she was told, you don't got much more time. It could, your heart could stop at any moment, Faith. Your heart could stop at any moment, Faith. Here's, here's your life expectancy, Faith. Her whole life. So she was actually going to give some of her life, whatever life she had left, and God would grant her to the medical field because she had studied and gone through so much with her condition. She thought maybe God can use me in there to be a person of faith for people. But in the middle of that, she just felt a call to you know, a different type of healing, not just the heart healing, but spiritual healing and a call to come into ministry and support the ministry of discovery. And so Pastor Veronica and I hired her full time and, and, and she had never had a full time job. In fact, some people were like, you cannot hire this girl full time. 
she, can, she can't work that much. She has uh, uh, trouble even breathing. You know, she can't. And, and here she is. She's at her office going up and down the steps all day, every day. She's running around here and stuff. And, and at first, people were like, oh, my gosh, so, like, take care of that girl. And we, we were, but we're like, this, this girl wants to serve God. She went recently to get her longevity test over in L.A., and they said, we don't know what happened, but you're, you're, this is a miracle. Whatever's happening to your heart, it's a miracle. They said, they, for the first time, they said, we can't give you an expectancy date anymore. It looks like you're going to live a long life, Faith. Now, she still is on, I don't know, 20 medications. She has to take antibiotics. She gets a fever. She got no spleen. She's got to go to the doctor. Okay? She's, it, God didn't, so this is, God didn't put her heart back on the right side, didn't, didn't give her a full heart, didn't, didn't, no, he, he didn't do all that. And the, the Apostle Paul actually had this ailment, a, he called a thorn in his flesh that he, he desperately wanted to be healed from. Let me show it to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and then I'm going to tell you one more thing we're going to pray. Paul says three times, different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. For my power works best when you're weak, Paul. See, it's actually when you need me and when you're weak that that. If you just had all the power and it went your way and always went your way, then, then you wouldn't cry out to me. I actually like you being a little bit weak because that's when I can be invited to be your power. So my power is perfected when you need me and when you're weak. And so he goes, wow, God told me. So he didn't take it away from me. He told me he wants to show power in me through it. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so the power of Christ can work through me, here's what you need to know about every illness, every disease, every issue, every challenge that Jehovah Rapha wants to meet in your life. Here's what you need to know about it. The process is the point. The point isn't the miracle and the point isn't the healing. Listen to me. The process is the point. In other words, he says, I want to take that painful experience and develop you from the inside out. Now, if you're like me, you don't like that part. I would much rather show up in heaven dumb and as sharp as jello. Just heal me, okay, God? But God's like, no, no, no. I got something better for you, so I'm going to sharpen you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it to develop you. I'm going to take you through weakness, desperation. I bring you to places where you either choose to cry out or complain, but I'm doing something inside of you. The process is the point to experience Jehovah Rapha. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.